Thank you. Um, I um, have the great pleasure to introduce the director of uh, NASA Ames Research. And when I first got into contact, my first contact with space exploration was actually not Aztec, but was NASA Ames. And so for me, that's a very dear place. And as his title says already, the, indeed the place to search for life in the universe. I didn't know we, it also was about our future, but the, the, the search I did know. Um, what I know about our speaker, Pete Warden, is that he is um, a man deeply, I mean, a deep passion for space and for the space research, probably stemming also from the uh, time you were a planetary sciences uh, professor at Arizona, not a, not a bad place to be at well, as well. I mean, it's uh, send us, uh, wasn't it the um, lander in 2007, the next lander? And, um, and also, what's nice about Ames, if you've ever been to Ames, you know, it's easy. We have Google Earth, you know, go on Google Earth, type in NASA, NASA Ames, zoom in, and then go bi a bit north. And where are you then? Googleplex. Which actually sums up what Pete is doing right now with, uh, with, with NASA Ames. Not that he is just working with Google, although that's a good idea because they like space and so, you know, great things might come of that. But also that Pete is trying to get um, partnerships with private industry, small, bigger partnerships to further, uh, you know, the research and not just have it dependent on what comes down from Washington in the sense of money or, or grants you can get. And, um, and, you know, that's very promising. And I think uh, great things will come of that. One of the things that are already coming of it is small CubeSats that are being built and uh, sent, you know, because small CubeSats, of course, like we already said with our excellence and our CubeSats to Mars project ourselves of Explore Mars, you know, that's doable financially. And so, you know, it's easier to set up. And still, because we have been getting better at better at getting things smaller. If I look at my own camera that I just bought, I mean, it's, you know, 21 zoom and so many possibilities that I still have to study it for a year or so before I know everything. And that's, you know, just one of the things that tell us that the possibilities of doing great things with small cube sets is endless, really. Anyway, I'm not going to take any more of Pete's time because I really want to know what our future is and how to do the search of life in the universe, of course. But I thought, you know, Ames can do that really well. So I'm quite confident that that will be pulled off. Pete, come over and tell us. Thank you. It's uh, with some trepidation that I talked today because I was given some wine at lunch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, my leadership talked on Tuesday, and so following your boss is always a dangerous thing. Uh, so if, if I say anything inconsistent with him, you erase it from the record. Uh, they did review what I have to say, so I think it's fine. Uh, but uh, uh, what, what I wanted to do today is, is put the whole concept of Mars and uh, exploration of Mars, uh, living on Mars, in kind of a broader context. And I think this is, a, this is an important thing to do. Uh, it's particularly hard in this city, uh, and I'm always nervous about, you know, with capital behind me and, you know, other things, but, uh, uh, but uh, let, let, let me try to take a little shot at that. Now, uh, Ames is the center uh, for uh, something called the Astrobiology Institute, uh, and it really was sort of the, the beginning of astrobiology, and there are three astrobiology questions. So, when you think about space, I like to think about these and, and really say that space is all about life. Uh, you know, there's, there's two fundamental science questions. Uh, probably the only other one that to me is exciting is how did the universe begin uh, and also how it's going to end. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's the, the, the life questions are how did life begin? Uh, we don't have the slightest idea. Uh, but the second question is one that we think might give us some hints, and that is, where else is there life? Uh, and uh, Mars, obviously, is a, is a key target, but there are other places. I want to talk to you just a little bit about, about that, to put it in context. 
But maybe the most important question of all of astrobiology, which we don't spend enough time considering, is what's the future of life in the universe? And I think this future starts with us. Uh, and this is really where I put the human exploration programs uh, with the eventual goal of spreading humanity into the solar system and beyond. Uh, and I want to talk about new technologies because I think that's really key. Uh, well, let me start with technologies. Uh, a long time ago, uh, when I was young, even when Buzz Aldrin was young, uh, was what I call the aerospace era. You know, this is a pretty cool era. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, we built rockets. We did space travel, you know, Apollo program. We've been to uh, every planet in the solar system and are about to go to one that used to be a planet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, you know, kind of, kind of a neat thing. We did a lot of stuff. Uh, but I'd like to make the point that this century uh, is, is as much the aerospace era as a biological era. And I put this gentleman's picture on here for a couple reasons. First, his brother works for me. Uh, the, uh, uh, but we're also partnered with him. This is uh, uh, J. Craig Venter. And uh, uh, I think he sort of showed us what may be the future of, of not just life on Earth, but life in the solar system and beyond. And, and what he's done is he's turning biology from a, uh, a, a study discipline or a, uh, maybe a little bit of witch doctory uh, into real engineering uh, to the point where we can actually not only read DNA, uh, but right DNA. And, and, and you might remember Craig is the first one to have decoded the human genome. Uh, he also was the first one to make a synthetic organism uh, where he took and built up the DNA uh, from the DNA base pairs of a known bacteria and then booted it up. Uh, this is real engineering. And so I want to make the point that, that this may be as important as the rockets and other technology we did last century. Well, let me start about the search for life because I think this is, a, you know, I'm not going to talk much about the origin of life uh, plus, you can get in trouble politically about that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I do want to talk about uh, the, uh, uh, I refer you to uh, Neil, DeGra or Neil deGrasse Tyson if you want to hear about that. Uh, but, uh, but let me talk about the search for life. You know, obviously, the first target is, is what you're here for, is Mars. Uh, now, you know, M Mars is, 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 is interesting for a lot of perspectives. It is clearly the most Earth-like planet in the solar system. But when we got there uh, in the 1970s, uh, people said it didn't look very Earth-like, and, and these are the kind of pictures we got. Uh, now, to me, when I was in graduate school at the University of Arizona, this looked very Earth-like. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of a, you know, uh, <laughs> but others said no. But we found a lot about Mars, and I, and I want to keep your, your mind on this issue. It's water. Uh, and... Uh, you know, the picture on the left is from one of the orbiters. Uh, there's a glacier. There's actually snow. It snows on Mars. Uh, you know, begins to sound a lot more Earth-like. Uh, and then when we sent Phoenix there uh, and dug into the, to the, to the regolith uh, in the higher latitudes, we found just below the surface is ice. In fact, we now believe if we melted all of the water on Mars, we'd have an ocean several hundred meters thick. Uh, and we see water flowing. Uh, you know, these little fingers of things appear to be fluid, probably water, probably a saline water, uh, so that it can still flow uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the low pressure. Uh, so one of the key things is Mars is beginning to show a lot of evidence for water, even liquid water. Now, uh, I, I'm sure you've heard a lot about curiosity, uh, but uh, uh, it is the next step to, uh, to determine whether life ever existed there. Now, I'm very anxious that we move on to not just seeing whether life used to exist on Mars. So hopefully in the next few years, various NASA programs will, uh, and our partners around the world will, will check a much more interesting question. And this is one I'm going to return to, is, is there life currently on Mars? And because that is a big question, and it's a big question about our future, uh, and it's a big question about how life began. But I want to point out there are other places in the solar system where we might find life. Uh, Venus is an interesting one. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, the surface is like 800 degrees centigrade, so not likely to have life. Uh, probably true. However, the upper atmosphere uh, at about 60 kilometers is about one Earth atmosphere, uh, and the temperature is kind of like it is here in this room. Uh, 
So interesting conditions. Now there's a few things like sulfuric acid and other things floating around, but we know life can exist in those environments. We see it on Earth. Uh, we also suspect that Venus has been salted with life from Earth and maybe even from Mars uh, over uh, billions of years of asteroid bombardment. So, and there are some very suspicious uh, spectral signatures in the Martian upper atmosphere, so, or, or Venus. So Venus is a very interesting target as well. Uh, moons. Uh, this is pretty exciting. There's a lot of moons in the solar system, and we're seeing that they may be one of the more interesting places to look for life. Uh, this is Enceladus, one of the inner moons of Saturn. Uh, we know that Enceladus have, has geysers uh, of water spraying into space. Uh, water again. Uh, every place on Earth we find water, we find life. Uh, this actually may make it easier to sample it, where you don't even have to land on it. You just fly through the plumes, grab the water, and then determine whether there's organic molecules there. Now this object is very high on NASA's priority list. This is Europa. Uh, the, uh, uh, when we look at the, uh, it, it's uh, you know, one of the large moons of Jupiter, but the, Jupiter's gravity uh, compresses and expands uh, Europa, so it's heated. Uh, in fact, we're pretty sure there's a huge ocean of water uh, right below an ice, ice that's probably a few kilometers thick. Uh, and at the bottom of that ocean, which may be tens of kilometers thick, it's a lot like the bottom of the Earth's ocean, we think, where there's volcanic activity that's providing energy and other things. Uh, a lot of people think life could have arisen uh, on Earth in the bottom of the oceans. Uh, so we'd really like to try to go there, and, and for a couple of decades, we've talked about how do you get through the ice, but it turns out we might not have to go through the ice because we see geysers of water on Europa as well. Uh, so again, it may be pretty cheap to actually go and get to Europa. Now, there's another place that's kind of interesting, Titan, the, the biggest moon in the solar system. It's only a little smaller than Mars. Uh, and it has lakes on it. Now, these are not lakes of water. They're lakes of, of hydrocarbon. So this is the Saudi Arabia of the future solar system. Uh, but these are ethane and methane. Uh, but uh, uh, there is thoughts that you could have methanogens, uh, bacteria that that operate under a methane cycle. In fact, they exist on Earth. Uh, and again, there is some evidence of, uh, and, and this is an, another point I'm gonna keep returning to. If you, if you wanna find evidence of life, the first is a fluid, the second is a non-equilibrium gas, something that needs some chemical process like life to maintain. Uh, and we have some evidence of that, both in the Venusian upper atmosphere as well as in, uh, as in Titan's atmosphere. So there could be weird life. On, on Titan that, is, uh, that, that operates under methane and other uh, processes uh, with hydrocarbons and uh, strange gases. So Titan is a very interesting place. Now, I mentioned CubeSats. How do we get to these places cheaply? Uh, and I put this up here both because I'm a University of Michigan grad and this is a professor at Michigan. Uh, but plus I think it's pretty cool uh, that we think in the next few years that we can take a CubeSat anywhere in the solar system using solar electric propulsion. Uh, his uh, project, which we hope to fly early next year, uh, uses a solar electric uh, system uh, that will provide uh, uh, up to 10 kilometers a second delta V. Uh, with that, you can get all sorts of interesting places like fly through the plumes on Enceladus and Europa. And by the way, I think Ceres may have plumes as well. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting places in the solar system. but. Uh, uh, I'm a stellar astronomer by background, so let me turn to outside the solar system. Uh, this is a mission you might have heard of. Uh, the uh, conceived at Ames, built jointly by JPL and Ames. You know, the, for once JPL did a good job, so I have to <laughs> give them credit. <laughs> they usually do a good job. Cost too much, but they do a good job. But uh, uh, this is really neat. This is a cool mission. And, and, and by the way, if you ever meet Bill Baruchi, who is the principal investigator on this, this is an example of somebody who is persistent. Uh, he came up with this idea in the 1980s. And I remember hearing him in a talk. And I said, well, that's all rubbish. And, but he didn't think so. The idea is if you, if you look at a star, a lot of stars, and you, you watch it, and you look at the light level fluctuations, that if, you, if there's a planetary system which is edge on, which statistically 
some of them will be, is the planet goes in front of the star, you get a small decrease in light. Uh, just to put that on scale, something the size of the Earth and, the, and, the, and going around the sun is about 30 parts per million, so it's a pretty hard job to do. He submitted this proposal five times before it was accepted. So when I have some of my young staff that say, well, I submitted a proposal and it got turned down, I'm quitting. You know, it's kind of, go talk to Bill. Uh, but, uh, you know, this looked at about 150,000 stars like the sun. Uh, we are finding a lot of, of, uh, of planets in the habitable zone. And again, we define the habitable zone as, again, where liquid water is. Uh, uh, so this is one of the first planets we found. Uh, the, uh, we found systems that got some planets that, are, you know, aren't much bigger than the moon. Uh, so we're finding a lot of small ones. Uh, now, I found this one one of the most interesting things. Uh, again, in the last century, uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, we were told you couldn't have planets in binary star systems. You know, couldn't happen, physics wouldn't work, you know. Uh, well, the real universe doesn't read my textbook. Uh, and we're finding a lot of planets in binary star systems. This was the first one we found. Uh, and this reminded us of something. Uh, the, uh, that uh, if you remember, Luke Skywalker had the double star. And so we did a little artistic change here and what it would look like, although the planet's surface temperature is about 150 degrees below zero, uh, so he'd probably have to wear more clothes. Uh, but uh, it was nice. The nice people from Lucasfilms let us call this uh, Tatooine. So we now have found Tatooine. Uh, but most recently, and this is just a, f uh, a week or so ago, we have identified the first Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, ab absolute Earth-size. Uh, it it's in a star cooler than the sun an M star, which is what most of the stars are in the galaxy. In fact, we're going to start focusing now Kepler on, on these stars as well as follow-on missions. But uh, uh, this is interesting. Uh, we now think maybe a quarter of the stars in the galaxy have a planet the size of the Earth in the habitable zone. Uh, now what we'd want to look for, again, I, I, I show these as, as the planetary atmospheres. Uh, if Mars and Venus have life, it doesn't have very much, uh, certainly. But what we see on Earth is uh, two things that, are, that we would look for in a planet around another star for evidence of life. The first is water, and the second is the non-equilibrium gas, in our case, oxygen. So this is where NASA is focusing its effort in the future. The, the first mission is TESS, which is going to be launched in about three years. Uh, it's going to look at all the nearby stars and see which ones of them have an eclipsing star. If they do, we can make a spectrum of that to, star or that planet that star and if the planet goes in front of the star in some cases we can actually extract what the planetary atmosphere is because some of the starlight goes through the atmosphere so we may by the end of this decade begin to see if there's life around some nearby stars but you know what we really want to do is image them and to get a spectrum and that's hard because a a uh, uh, planet is about a billion times fainter than the star and that's a, a real challenge but remembering bill baruki we think we can do it in fact, we might be able to do it early in this next decade. There are proposals that we would put what's called a coronagraph, which is a way to image these planets, uh, on the AFTA, uh, which is a, we, the, the nice people in the intelligence community had a couple spare space telescopes they gave us. Uh, so we're thinking of using one of those to, to both look at how the universe began, but also how, whether we can find life. But eventually we want to do a terrestrial planet finder. Uh, probably sometime uh, late next decade. Uh, so we think we can get there. Now let me talk about human exploration. Now, obviously the, the target is what you guys are talking about is Mars. Uh, but uh, you know, this may be the elephant in the room, but what if there's life already on Mars? You know, and uh, uh, now this may become a bipartisan problem because if there's life already on Mars, those on the right wing side are worrying about it killing us. Those on the left wing side are worried about us killing it. So <laughs> you could have a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So not to be, you know, not to, you know, that, I don't know what the solution is there, but, uh, uh, but let's look at other places. Now the moon. The moon is, is, is already a key, you know, I know it's probably in a Mars group, it's bad to bring up a picture of this object. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting object, uh, and uh, uh, at the minimum, we're going to use it for testing our technology for going deeper into space. Uh, but I put it up there also because Ames has done a lot of cool stuff with it. Uh, we had the LCROSS mission, which was a, a secondary mission. 
Uh, it was a cheap mission. It was like 75 million. And uh, uh, we were going to run the upper stage. We did run the upper stage into the, uh, into the polar craters where we think there's water and confirm there's a lot of water, like 4 or 5 percent. Uh, the, uh, now, I got accused of, actually, it was my fault because I said something about El Cross was bombing the moon. Yeah. So, uh, but because I was an Air Force officer, we also have a strafing mission. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 you can't do just bombing, you have to do strafing. <laughs> you know, I, I have to tell you, I got in trouble for that. I'll probably get in trouble for this, but the, uh, you, you know, I thought it was kind of cute to say something about that, and I, and I put it on Twitter. And, uh, and, and that was a big mistake, because I had <laughs> hundreds of people said, yeah, I was an Air Force general who was uh, you know, involved with Star Wars. You know, obviously, they put two and two together to get 86. What I'm trying to do is, is uh, you know, there were aliens in the poles of the moon, and I was going to bomb them and get rid of them, uh, and, and start an interplanetary war. So I got letters from, you know, or, or emails from, so I'm a mother. I have an 8-year-old and a 10-year-old. Please don't kill them. You know, don't start an interstellar war. It's terrible. <laughs> Uh, but anyhow, between these two missions, the aliens are gone. Uh, but this is a pretty cool mission, too. You know, we, we ran this one on the moon as well uh, last, last week. Uh, but uh, uh, this was also a low-cost mission, and, and I couldn't resist putting this picture up. Uh, we launched this on an old ICBM, uh, and uh, uh, Fred the Frog was also launched. Uh, Now, now, my wife asked me, how was the frog? And, and, and I said, oh, I, I'm sure he's fine, dear. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, uh, I think this is a really cool picture. You know, we should launch more things you can see from Washington and New York City. Uh, this is from New York City. Uh, now, I always thought as an Air Force general to see an ICBM rising over New York or Washington was a bad idea. Uh, but uh, this was a pretty good idea. And, uh, you know, I just want to show, you know, the... Uh, uh, when we launched Elcross, uh, Goddard had an instrument or, called uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, still there. Uh, and this is pretty neat technology. This is a picture it took of Laddie uh, in uh, lunar orbit, and we were able to kind of reconcile it. Uh, so pretty cool. That you can, on another world, you can take pictures of satellites from one other satellite. So pretty cool. But at any rate, you know, the moon has, uh, and, the, and the polar craters, all this stuff. This is the basic stuff of life. Uh, so the idea that you could potentially visit, live off the land, and maybe even have settlements there uh, is a, in addition to uh, Mars. So again, when people ask, you know, well, are we abandoning the moon? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, we're going to all these places. Uh, but then I want to talk about asteroids, which I'm a real fan of asteroids because they run into things, and that's something I like to do. Uh, but uh, also, asteroids have a lot of water. And uh, uh, this is Vesta, uh, which we found doesn't have much water, but we think Ceres does. Uh, uh, well, this, this was a, uh, the Dawn mission, which is about to, to end up at Ceres. So I think asteroids are another place to not only look for life, but potentially could host life. Uh, and, and so I'm really pleased that NASA has, has decided to do the asteroid redirect mission, because it enables us to understand these objects. Uh, understand that you can move stuff around in space, uh, you can protect the planet, uh, which is, has to do with our future. Uh, and it, I think it's an ideal step towards, uh, towards Mars, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Well, let me talk about some key technologies. And uh, I put these up because they're interesting and they're also kind of scary. Uh, you know, one of the things I think we need is uh, much more autonomy, autonomous robots and so on. So uh, this is a quantum computer. Actually, more correctly, it's a quantum annealing device. Uh, there's a difference. But uh, uh, we, we, we mentioned the, the little startup next door, uh, Giggle or Google, I think. Uh, they've, they've decided to work with us on something called the uh, Quantum Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Uh, so they bought this machine, uh, which is uh, the world's largest quantum computing device. Uh, we think it may be the next step to true artificial intelligence. Uh, we're very interested in it. Uh, we think we can provide robots the ability to, uh, to go into Martian caves and see if there's life there and so forth using uh, ad advancement of this technology. So I just emphasize that this is one of the things that is coming down the pike that could make our missions a lot easier. 
Uh, the other one is uh, from Craig Venter is synthetic biology, the ability to engineer microbes. You know, if you go to Mars and want to live on the surface, what do you really want? You, you, know, you kind of want a self-replicating programmable machine. Uh, fortunately, that exists. It's called life. And uh, this is cyanobacteria, which, uh, uh, not being a biologist, I said, what is it really? And they said, it's pond scum. <laughs> and, uh, but it's a really neat life form. In fact, it may be the earliest life form on Earth. It may have come from Mars. Uh, the, uh, it's photosynthetic bacteria that, in the presence of water, uh, and a few trace elements like you find on the moon and are on Mars, uh, and light, you can engineer stuff. And the stuff can include sugar. It can actually fix metals and do a lot of other things. So what we would look at in the future is maybe a you know, moon or Mars 2.0 is that you don't need to actually send everything there. You can just send the code and print out life and things that can engineer things. And now you might say, well, this is really science fiction. Uh, in fact, it's called bioteleportation. Uh, but I do want to show you something. This, this is my friend Craig Venter again. Uh, we were out in the desert. Uh, you know, he has this very luxurious motorhome and uh, motorcycles, uh, but he also brought this thing out. Uh, this is a genetic, uh, a portable genetic coding laboratory. Uh, and so Chris McKay said, well, let's see if we can take this. This is cyanobacteria uh, that I showed you that lives under a rock. In fact, if you, if you look at Mars, it may be something you'd find under rocks. And, uh, uh, and we decoded it, we sent it back to Craig's laboratory, and he's busy seeing if we can reassemble it. So bioteleportation, and which by the way isn't limited to just going to the moon or Mars, you might be able to go interstellar distances, which I'm going to talk about a little later. Well, you know, a lot of this is, is interesting, but just to kind of briefly cover what is it NASA is doing. The first one is we have this wonderful biological laboratory, and uh, uh, on Friday last week, uh, I'm really proud to say Ames launched seven payloads. Uh, on board that. Take that, Goddard. Uh, uh, but they're, they're all working so far, by the way. I couldn't say that yesterday, but we finally got in touch. We launched three small satellites uh, and, uh, on the Falcon 9, and we have, uh, our four, uh, we have four payloads on board uh, to do biology, uh, including a whole bunch of fruit flies that we're actually going to dissect the little things and take their hearts out. It's kind of horrible. My wife didn't like that either. <laughs> But the other neat thing about the ISS and, and is uh, it's a launch platform. And we can launch CubeSats from there. And, and this is the world's smallest satellites with the world's biggest satellites. The middle one is Ames. Uh, the other ones are commercial. Uh, no JPL or Goddard ones yet. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a neat thing that we can do. Uh, it's really, uh, uh, you know, it's changed things. The, the, these CubeSats go up in the checked luggage uh, and they get kicked out. Uh, in fact, a couple of my former employees started a company called Planet Labs. They launched 28 of these things to do imaging of the Earth uh, here about a month or two ago. So this is really changing things. Uh, and of course, the ARM mission is probably going to carry, uh, and any other missions, we're going to start carrying a bunch of small sats and CubeSats that could, I think, are the, one of the ways to really look, at, look for life on Mars and elsewhere. Uh, but I'd like to put this object up uh, because uh, you know, people say, well, what are you focusing on asteroids for? And uh, my answer to them is that this may be an asteroid. Uh, the, you know, it may not be, but it's about the size of an asteroid. Uh, the moons of Mars, I think, and we're beginning to look at them, is in a, the, the next steps after the asteroid retrieval mission is to go to Mars. They're also ideal locations to do a really thorough telerobotic exploration of the Martian surface and fig figure out whether it has life, of course, to be followed by humans on Mars. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about commercial stuff. And, you know, a, few, a year or two ago, everybody said, oh, that's rubbish. There isn't any commercial stuff. But I think, you know, we've seen here a huge change of that with the Dragon capsule. We're seeing commercial folks building uh, robots to land on the moon. Uh, in fact, one of them is actually based in Moffett Field, our, our research park. Uh, we're seeing international stuff. That's an Israeli program, which I think has a good chance of actually winning the prize. Uh, so a, lots of, a lot of commercial and non-traditional partners uh, getting into space. Uh, of course, there's uh, companies that are now think they can make money uh, from the moon and asteroids, uh, including mining the asteroids. Uh, and I put this picture up. Uh, this appeared on Google's website about five or six years ago. 
Uh, and it, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was recruiting people to go one way to Mars. And everybody laughed at it. I said, well, it was April 1st. It was April Fool's Day. Uh, first of all, I know the, the, you know, this was a, supposedly a joint venture between Virgin and Google. Uh, and they had Richard Branson and the two Google founders talking about it. Uh, and they said, well, it's just a joke. Uh, now, I know those guys, and I don't really think it's a joke. Uh, and we're now seeing Mars One and others that, uh, so uh, the idea that humans can go to Mars with the private sector is a very big one, and I think it's one that, that uh, we should work on. In fact, we are working on it. Uh, SpaceX, you know, it's, uh, you've heard of them. Uh, that's the Dragon capsule, but it turns out, interesting, it was designed, it can actually land on, Mar on the Martian surface. Uh, so using a Falcon 9, heavy, uh, we think we can go to uh, the Martian surface. We're working on this as a potential way to, to put a drill, to drill pretty deep uh, into the surface, but it, a, a pretty affordable mission as well. So there's a lot of stuff. Now, let me close with Interstellar. And, you know, and this always gets kind of laughed at as it's science fiction, but I think we can start thinking about it. Uh, first of all, as I said, we've got all these planets that we're finding in the habitable zone. Chances are a lot of the nearby stars uh, could have planets in the habitable zone. Uh, this is an interesting star. Uh, it's the nearest star, star system. There's actually three stars in the system. Uh, one of them slightly bigger than the sun, uh, one slightly smaller, uh, and then one's a lot smaller. Uh, but the, it's about a little older than the, than the, the sun is. Uh, uh, so the question is, are there planets? Remember I said there are planets around binary stars. Are there planets uh, in the habitable zone uh, of, these, uh, of these stars? And we think uh, within a few years we can build a small sat, not quite a CubeSat, unless you want to call it 27U CubeSat, but uh, you know, like a 25 centimeter aperture that we can find if there are planets in the habitable zone around Alpha Centauri A and B. Uh, so, you know, and this, by the way, we think is something that can be cheap enough that uh, the private sector uh, can work with us on it. We are talking to a couple of folks now about it. Uh, let me go back to the CubeSats. Uh, combination of electric propulsion, solar electric propulsion, and electric light sailing, uh, it can't get us interstellar distances, but it can get us into near interstellar space. Uh, and I think it can do this in the next few decades. Uh, Lou Friedman, who was at the conference, I guess, but he wasn't able to make it for lunch, uh, you know, has written a lot on this, so I refer you to some of his papers. But if we can get up to a few hundred kilometers a second, which between this electric CubeSats and solar sails, we think we can, we can get out into near interstellar space. And uh, uh, one of the more interesting points is what's called the gravity lens point. The sun actually can act as a lens. So you could line the probe up at about 500 astronomical units with one of these nearby stars, and you might even be able to image if there's a, you know, what the planet looks like and see continents. I know this was a challenge that Dan Golden said. So uh, we're kind of interesting, we're interested in, in this. Uh, again, it's something potentially the private sector could do. Uh, but you only make to do a couple passes by the sun. Now you need to get within a tenth of an astronomical unit, so it's a little toasty. But uh, the technology exists to do it. So. Uh, this is a challenge, I think, but, but it is now the time to set our sights not only on Mars and getting people there, but getting people throughout the solar system and then thinking about beyond. Well, let me stop there. I'd be happy to ask any questions, and, uh, but I, 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 I'm, it's an exciting time. Uh, I'm really excited about NASA's programs. I'm excited about our partners, uh, not only the private sector partners, but our international partners. Uh, you know, this is the neatest time to be alive. So, uh, uh, Godspeed to all of you and Godspeed to Mars. Thank you. Probably more to do with that building over there that you can see on the horizon. What would give us a better chance? Well, I think the key thing we really do need to find out is if there is extant life there. Uh, I suspect if it is, it's below the surface, uh, so we're going to have to drill. Uh, although it may be by, you know, we see these fluid flows, those are obviously access points. Uh, there's something that's heating the interior. Mars does not have a large scale molten core like the Earth does, but there does appear to be hot spots you know, that are probably residual radioactivity. 
Uh, so there may be large scale liquid flows below the surface. We probably need to get into those. Uh, and uh, so the first thing is, you know, is what do you find? Now it may be that we're all Martians, that life arose on Mars and it came here through impacts, uh, in which case we're probably consistent with it. I mean, you, so you, and, and, and maybe the best way to do this is we go to Mars, if we find life there, in fact, Dr. Venter and I have discussed this, and then you, rather than bring it back at huge money, you, and a lot of argument, uh, you just decode it and, uh, and then send the bits back and then we reassemble it in a P4 containment facility. Uh, or maybe we do it in space, that's, a, that's an argument. Uh, and we can figure out, you know, are we compatible with it? Is it something that's it's gonna kill us or we're gonna kill it? Uh, and I think that's an urgent thing to do. Uh, so, you know, NASA's programs to find out if there's life on Mars really are a top priority. Uh, well, I mean, it, yeah, I want to emphasize, I mean, I talked, this is obviously an AIM-centric focus. It, you know, if I was at JPL, I would have talked more about their stuff. Uh, it'd be more boring, but that's, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they give me a hard time about curiosity all the time. That's a really neat mission. But, uh, but uh, I think the, you know, increasingly the centers are working closely together. But the stuff that I'm most interested in is, uh, it personally are the, uh, these CubeSats. And can we put propulsion on CubeSats? Can we get them uh, into, uh, you know, into interplanetary space? Can we do neat science with them? And I think that's the thing that I'm most excited about. And, it, and, and I wouldn't just stop at CubeSats. One of the things we launched, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this last week was KickSat. And it, it was actually a, a Cornell mission that was funded by Kickstarter. And uh, uh, it, had, uh, it has 110 little tiny, chip, tiny chipsets. And uh, uh, so w when it launches those here in a week or so, you know, I won't have any argument from any other NASA center to say, look, Ames launched, you know, like 220 satellites this last year. What did you do? Uh, but, but that is a revolution. Uh, we think using solar technology and other things, we can actually move these things around. So the whole idea of getting smaller and cheaper, that's the thing that's most exciting to, to me. And, and, and Ames is playing a lead role in that. I, I do want to emphasize, you know, you know, not the only one we're working with a lot of other centers. Uh, one of the other things that we're working with Marshall on, it's really led by Marshall, is 3D printing. And I think the administrator talked about that. Uh, we'll soon launch a 3D printer to the ISS. In fact, it might be up there now. You know, it's the made in space uh, printer. Uh, so, you know, the idea of, of printing things in space. Uh, synthetic biology is another one. Uh, once we can print things out, maybe we can print out a bacteria with programmed genes. So, anyway, over here. Your uh, mission at Mars just reminded me of a, uh, a very interesting upcoming experiment. The Sun Jammer experiment. Have you heard about that? Yes. Yeah, it's the uh, solar sail experiment. Yep. Next year. And that's a pretty it's been put on hold, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. it, it, it had been put on hold. We, they, we, we had a, the usual budget problem, so those guys over there again. And, uh, but uh, uh, we're working with them. I'm very excited about uh, solar sails. I think, uh, again, Marshall's working closely with us on that as well. So there's a, uh, uh, you know, how you get things into, you know, cheaply around the solar system. But uh, uh, th there, there were some engineering issues, that, but we'll get around those. Exactly, and that's why the technology program is so important. I mean, I, you know, uh, the uh, missions are cool, but uh, you know, one of the neatest things that happened the last few years was restarting NASA's uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate, and it's, it's you know, that's one of their programs. Uh, they're also doing a lot of the 3D printing, which I think, and they're, and they're funding the small nanosats. So uh, 
you know, I think that you know when we talk about going to Mars and 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 sending people there, we really need the new technology. That's uh, that's critical. So, yeah. Uh, how, how outrageous, given the, uh, the movement towards the asteroid retrieval uh, activities, how outrageous is it to consider the possibility that there would be uh, extant, or well, not extant, but, but extinct or potential signs of some life? That uh, is anybody given that some thought, either driven it to the ground, saying no way. Well, there's a, there's a couple interesting things. First of all, we have a lot of pieces of asteroids on the ground. I mean, those are, you know, meteorites. They have to come through. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the, the interiors of them have, have been looked at. Although you'll, uh, there was a decade or so ago, there was a, an alleged discovery of life on a, what, a Martian meteorite. I mean, it, it turned out to be incorrect. It also turned out about, be careful what you tell the White House. Uh, that was a long, interesting story for a drink. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, so that's a good source. Uh, you know, I think a, a, you know, one of the possibilities in, in a longer talk uh, talk about is that it may be that life arose, and that's the original life, in interstellar space. And that uh, it's been spread throughout the galaxy, you know, by, you know, the, the flow of interstellar materials, which are, some of them are trapped in meteor, uh, you know, in meteors and asteroids. So, you know, that's an interesting thing. The other one, as I mentioned, you know, the big asteroids, uh, uh, some of them are differentiated. In fact, we think Ceres is differentiated, that it was, that it has a, it had a molten core. And in fact, the fact that it has geysers on it now suggests something may still be going on, residual radioactivity. So uh, when we go to places like Ceres and bigger objects, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing to look. Do we see biological precursors? Do we see even potentially evidence for life? Uh, so, you know, but again, what makes this really cool is these low-cost missions. Low-cost that, that a lot of international partners can do them. You know, I, a few years ago, I started working with somebody you don't think of as a, as a space power was Lithuania. And uh, uh, they just launched their first two uh, CubeSats. And, uh, you know, this means that, it, that, you know, lots of people that are really highly talented folks uh, uh, are going to begin to develop things. We're working with Mexico, uh, Colombia, uh, other countries. Uh, uh, around the world to, to, to bring this forward. So, yes, uh, you know, that's clearly a, a, a place to look uh, for pristine material. I mean, these are the building blocks of the solar system. So, you, you know, one of the big arguments we keep hearing is, ah, well, you know, is it Mars or the moon or asteroids? And my point is that's a silly argument. It's all the above. You know, we are going to find out where there's life and how it began and we're going to use all those places. We're going to go to them, and we may live on a few of them. So you know, it's a, uh, and I think they all play a significant role. And it's, you know, it's uh, the. I, I, I think NASA is on exactly the right track now, and Mars is our ultimate goal for the foreseeable future. You know, we're going to do things uh, with the Moon to test out our technologies, and we're going to do things with asteroids to develop our capabilities. So, you know, when people start criticizing, well, you know, but I, I think of it in terms of life. Yep. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, that was inconceivable, I suspect. So now, uh, the constraints, I believe, right now, we are all living with right now with respect to travel is the speed of light. Yes. So what are your thoughts on the speed of light? Well, I, 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 I'll attribute, in fact, there's a book that Venter wrote uh, recently. I think it was called Life at the Speed of Light or something. Uh, that he talks about bioteleportation. And he mentions in there, and he's one that really pushed this. You know, a few years ago, I got in trouble for doing something called the 100-year starship. And, uh, uh, you know, people sort of laughed at it. Uh, but uh, Venter came up with the idea how you actually could travel interstellar distances. We could conceivably get a few kilograms to the surface of a planet around Alpha Centauri, one of the stars, uh, in a few decades. I mean, there, you can imagine ways to do that. Uh, then you transmit the code, and it prints it out using the resources so you can boot it up, you know, at a distance. I mean, the light only, you know, light time was four years. So, so I think it's an interesting uh, possibility, and it's, it, it, it makes sense. Buzz, you had a question? Probably, probably argue, Buzz likes to argue with me on occasion. He's usually right, by the way. Yes, General. Yes. <laughs> Is any 
anybody uh, within NASA or uh, outside that you know of uh, doing research on gravity waves besides the Chinese? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> In fact, I just got back from Saudi Arabia. And, uh, uh, you know, th there's a mission that we've looked at with the Europeans called uh, LISA to detect gravity waves. And uh, uh, that's a huge mission. It probably would cost 10, 20 billion. Uh, we think that we can do a lot of these experiments to, to begin to detect gravity waves with small sats now. And so we have a, uh, uh, some missions we've been discussing uh, with the Saudis and uh, with the Germans uh, uh, that uh, potentially could, could build a mini LISA, you know, that you can begin to detect. You know, gravity waves will give us a probe of, 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 of uh, you know, the early universe and black holes and other kind of cool things that will begin to get us at that question, how did the universe begin? So uh, I'm quite excited that the potential of this new technology that we could probably in the early in the 2020s begin to have a gravity wave observatory. Uh, and it's, uh, but we're, we're starting to look at it. Let's see if we can do it with small satellites. Uh, and, and I'm anxious to spend other people's money. So, you know, if we, can, if, if we can spend Saudi money and German money, that's all the better. The people over here get happy uh, sometimes. But, uh, yeah, so. There's a guy in California. Yeah. Spend California money. Yep. <clears throat> Bob Baker. Oh, yeah. No, I, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of cool things to be done. So, yep. Yes, sir. Um, what's NASA A's role on the uh, asteroid rig drag mission? Yeah, we've been assigned a very interesting role, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, you know, obviously we're working with the other centers to help them on things like solar electric propulsion. But the main thing is that we're going to be the focal point for partnerships, uh, both international and private sector, as well as being the focal point for secondary uh, missions. You know, if you go to, a, you do this asteroid retrieval mission, if you look at the models, you know, okay, we're, we're trying to grapple this asteroid or a piece for the surface of one. You know, you really want a bunch of little helper satellites. And uh, we're looking at little CubeSat kind of things. Uh, and we hope that we, th that's a, something that partners will be very interested in. So uh, our, you know, our assigned role is now going to look at, uh, at partnerships and secondaries. So we're, we're pretty excited about it. Absolutely. In fact, that's why we're. <laughs> that's why I want to come because I. Yeah. Um, a question. This is actually about life on Earth as it applies to life in the larger universe. Yep. Well, that's an interesting question because we always tend to rate, well, NASA as a whole is the number one in the U.S. government for a good place. Ames is not quite so good, but part of that is, has to do with pay. You know, Google can give you like a zillion dollars and, you know, but I can let you go to Mars. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, uh, but, but it's, uh, you know, I think there's a, uh, quality of life is really important to inspire people. Uh, but. What I find is that the, 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 the thing a lot of the next generation is interested in is meaningful stuff. And uh, uh, they'll work, you know, 100 hours a week. If it's meaningful, they, don't, they aren't sleep deprived, they're pumped. And uh, I think a lot of the problems that we've got is that, is that we don't spend enough time getting young people excited about things. You know, I mean, they, they have a boring job and it's, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I sit through day-long meetings at places at headquarters, and that's boring. Uh, but uh, uh, if I had to do that all the time, you know, <laughs> I'd be pretty, uh, you know, sleep-deprived too. But if I go to, you know, I go out to walk around our center, and you know, we got people that, you know, building cubesats, uh, you know, thinking about uh, looking for life on Europa, and uh, 
uh, finding planets around nearby stars, uh, you know, that's pretty inspirational. So I, uh, you know, and NASA is one of the neatest organizations in the world to do that. So it, it uh, you know, it's an important thing. The other point is, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, I love Silicon Valley. It's, uh, although it's the most expensive place to live almost in the world now, uh, it's also pretty cool. It's a pretty energized place. Uh, uh, also, they make some of the best wine in the world. Uh, unlike JPL, you can buy a glass of wine at Ames. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I get in trouble for that one too. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I, I think I think you know it's a really good point that how do we inspire people? How do we make the quality of life good? Uh, you know, it helps with the sun shining. You know, it it, it helps with having really meaningful work. Uh, it helps to have a dynamic area. You know, I mean, I, I, I contrast Silicon Valley with, you know, I grew up in Detroit. Uh, so, you know, I've seen both sides. Uh, but there's a, there's a lesson there. When I was a kid, Detroit was the, had the highest per capita income of any major city in the U.S. It had over two million people, dynamic place, that if you don't keep your eye on the ball, you know, it goes away pretty fast. So, you know, it's a... You know that, that you know Silicon Valley 20 years from now could be a horrible, boring slum if we aren't careful. So. Well, Godspeed, and thank you so much. <laughs> On to Mars. Well, uh, Pete, of course, thank you very much, and here's a bottle of the red liquid to contemplate uh, life. Thank <laughs> you so much. Go NASA. <laughs>